Welcome to the program. I'm Jeff Sheckman. In our current political and social climate, when polarization is so extreme, when purity tests are often required by your tribe, the idea of compromise and what some call selling out takes on added weight and significance. But because positions and even sometimes values are often so extreme, does compromise and selling out even mean what it used to? And if not, can we actually square the circle of compromise, selling out, and ethics? That's our focus today with our guest, Inga Hansen. Inga Hansen is a clinical psychologist who leads outreach, equity, and inclusion for counseling and psychological services at Stanford. She's the co-founder and director of the Wayland Health Initiative and co-founder of Gender Inclusive Stanford. Most recently, she's the co-author of The Ethical Sellout, Maintaining Your Integrity in the Age of Compromise. Inga Hansen, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Well, it's great to have you here. What do we mean today when we talk about selling out? It's one of those phrases that, that arguably has a lot of different connotations to different people. True. And one of the things that I wanted to take a look at was how loaded that term is. You know, we tend to think of it as a failure failure of moral character or a, a traitorous act. It, it has some pretty strongly negative connotations historically, right? We tend to think of um, politicians, right, who have promised one thing and then they do something and else when lobbyists with deep pockets come into the into play, or we think of um, artists or musicians who really give up the soul of their art in order to be more commercially acceptable, and, and just in general, people who will do whatever it takes to get ahead. But one of the things that I think is also true is that all of us compromise in some ways in our lives, right? Um, we're told to live according to our values, to follow our moral compass, but there's not a lot of conversation about what you do if your needs and values are in conflict, or the values of your community clash with larger society, um, or what you need to be able to do to get by. And so one of the things that I wanted to bring into the conversation is selling out more as um, a nuanced decision-making in the face of choices that can be extremely difficult and people who aren't doing whatever it takes to get ahead, but more the minimum necessary to get by. Certainly a lot of what might constitute or what some people might see as selling out as some kind of a moral decision is really more of, of a sociological decision. Somebody, an artist, for example, that decides to do something to be more commercial or, or somebody coming out of college that says, I don't want to go work for corporate America and then winds up doing that. These aren't really moral decisions. They're really decisions that are shaped by cultural perceptions and don't really have a moral weight except in the mind of the individual that's thinking about it. Yes, I think that's absolutely true because those types of decisions you just described, Jeff, are really more, they don't hurt other people, right? They tend to be more something that can create an internal conflict. Um, but the experience can be the same in the sense of, oh, something doesn't quite square with my values or who I thought I was or intended to be. So it can be that same type of discomfort that we can associate with our conscience, right? Even though there's not really any victim involved. And one of the things that I believe is going on is that these types of decisions are becoming more and more difficult or more common as e economic pressures increase and, as you mentioned before, due to some of the sociopolitical pressures of our society, right? So if some identities, some people, some ways of life are more valued than others, and if kind of capitalism guides us in the sense that we have to do what sells, then we all end up in some situations where we have to decide between our more idealist selves and our more practical or pragmatic selves. And so I think that can be one common selling out scenario. Talk about the situations where there really are moral choices, where other people are impacted, and, and really the difference when those elements enter the equation. So one of the things that we did in my co-author, Lily Zhang and I did in preparation for this book was we sought out stories. And so we listened to stories from a lot of different people from different walks of life, identities, backgrounds, and so on, just to hear about when they had compromised, what selling out meant to them, and so on. And some of the stories did have an impact on others 
and in a way that I think some of us w might find more concerning. Um, so for instance, one of our storytellers, um, Abby was in a situation where she thought she had found her dream job, right? It was um, work that she really enjoyed. She was really appreciated on her job. She noticed that she kept getting raises and promotions. It felt almost too good to be true. And of course, it turned out that it was. Um, she found out that the owner of the company um, was keeping a second set of books and that he was really demoting and firing and laying off people in order to keep more money for himself. And all these raises and bonuses that she was getting was really a payment for her silence. And so that was a situation where she really had to choose between something that was very advantageous to her, um, but had a, a significant net negative impact on others. Um, another story that I feel like had more of a moral component to it was Jeanette, who was um, – she was a, a gay woman, but she was closeted, and she had found herself drawn to working in the military. She was a lawyer in the military, and this was during the era of Don't Ask, Don't Tell. And she found herself in a role that she was actually prosecuting members of the military for being LGBTQ. So this was her own community that she was discharging for having an identity you know, that she shared. And so I think there's another situation where other people are actually impacted to some degree or uh, to a great degree in many ways the other thing as you talk about in the ethical sellout that gets caught up in all of this is the idea of compromise sometimes yes so we we're the word compromise i think selling out is a type of compromise and Compromising itself is something we often have a more positive association with, right? That, that means that we're flexible. It means we're open to new ideas and so on. Um, but, the, of course, this feeling, the term selling out tends to have these very negative connotations. And so framing selling out as a type of compromise allows us to have, I believe, a little more nuance around this construct, right? That we do often have to see the gray areas rather than the black and white when we're confronted with decisions that are pitting us between our needs and our values or one value and another and so on, um, we're often not able to make a perfectly ideal choice. Often something does have to be flexed or compromised in order to move forward, and there's, there's not a way of avoiding that, right? And so then how do we think through those types of situations in a way that is as much in line with our values as possible, and how do we allow ourselves to compromise, have compassion with the need to compromise, um, and yet do so the smallest amount possible if what's getting flexed is something that's actually very near and dear to ourselves or our community. It's interesting how much of it has to do with language and framing as opposed to really digging into to, to the moral questions. Yes, well, I think that's one of the places where we can get pulled in, right? Because I think there are certain terms that we respond to at a very visceral, emotional level. And so then as soon as we hear the word, we don't want to identify with it. And I think that selling out is one of those terms. And so it's not that we aren't doing the thing. It's that we don't want to associate ourselves with doing the thing, right? And so the behavior is the same regardless. But one of the things that we're missing is a conversation about this behavior because the language is so scary to us, right? And so if we're f able to find new ways to frame it, then we're able to start the conversation. One of the constructs related to that that I found really interesting, it's this thing that in social psychology is called pluralistic ignorance. And that simply means that the public conversation around a behavior or a thing is very different from what people are actually doing privately. And so one example is with drinking in college, right? There was a study that was done where college students, they were talking a big talk about how much they drank, like how wasted they got this weekend and how like, you know, they were so out of control at this kegger they went to. Um, but when they were surveyed, it turned out that actually many of them were drinking very little. They were just talking this way because they thought everyone else was drinking. So then they were, but then since everyone was doing it, 
there was no opportunity to change the perception of how much this behavior was happening realistically. And so I think we're seeing something very similar with selling out or with these types of compromises, right? Because our public narrative is that we lead these values driven lives and we, um, and that materialism is actually, for instance, not terribly important to us and that we don't flex around things that are so fundamental. Um, and yet in private, we were hearing stories poor Pouring in with the ways that people had felt conflicted in this way and the ways that they had found themselves compromising, but then they think that they're alone. Yeah, I mean, there's this interesting conflict that, that comes up between the individual kind of moral perception and moral compass and what the social pressures, the societal pressures are that, that get put on. Right. I think that's very true, right? Um, we our social creatures, our communities and society often have a tremendous impact on our values and our behavior. And so when there seems to be some conflict, it, it, it often can create an experience of shame, right? That we're doing something wrong. We're doing something that um, we would be judged for if people knew about. And sometimes that is very much the case. Even if, as you said earlier, it's not necessarily a moral decision, sometimes we can be very much judged by our own communities by decisions that seem like they're reflect poorly on the community or aren't in line with community values or so on, um, there can still be a lot of challenges around that. And I think that can particularly be true for people who hold marginalized identities because then there can be, you know, um, some specific needs and pressures within that community, more of a need to know who can be trusted and who's not. And so, for instance, if you are from um, a historically marginalized community, like um, being um, a person of color and you are one of the first in your community to go to college and gain a lot of material wealth, there can be ambivalent feelings about that, right? It can be both, oh, we're really proud and excited for you, but now are you still one of us? Are you going to remember where you came from? Are you still going to advocate for the rest of us? Or are your priorities now with a privileged majority with the white majority and so on. And so um, even, and because of those multiple pressures, the person themselves can really feel conflicted around achievements that they've made. The other thing that it runs headlong into, even among the same individuals that, that struggle with this, is this perceived desire for authenticity today and how this in some ways is, is antithetical to, to the desire for authenticity. Yes, I think that's interesting. And this idea of authenticity treats our identities and our being somewhat as a monolith, right? Mm -hmm. You know, as, you know, okay, if this is who you are, um, the, the following demographics, identities, and so on, whether that you know, we're talking about um, being an artist or being female or being um, interested in um, an athlete or whatever, um, or, you know, race, ethnicity, gender identity, so on. Um, we kind of act like these are very static and that there's only going to be one that's important at any given time rather than the reality in terms of our identities, which is that we have so many intersecting identities, all of us, and that which ones rise to the top and can be most important can be quite fluid from one situation to the next, right? So if I'm at work, uh, parts of my identity are going to really be more relevant and on the surface than a, if I'm at home or with one group of friends than another or, or at a music concert and so on. And so what is authenticity, right? Is it, um, you know, is it, is it being all these things in a very public way that's very visible all the time? That's not really realistic or actually advisable <laughs> for any of us. And, but this desire for authenticity or this push for it, I think can come along with these expectations that a person's consistent across all these different circumstances and doesn't have that kind of flexibility to respond to situations with all these parts of us that are all true and real. And so I hope that we can find more of a place for that fluidity when we're talking about authenticity. And how do we begin to do that? How do we begin to find the, the right kind of context to look at, as, as you say in the title, a kind of ethical selling out? 
Well, I believe that there are several elements that we can take into decisions that feel like compromised decisions or what we call it impossible choices in the book. You know, situations that we know that there's something very important at stake. I think that those are times that it's helpful to bring in some tools that we all have, but we might not always necessarily be using in those situations. So a few of the things that we talk about include compassion, which I think can be a surprising one for some people because when we think about selling out, it can feel so much more like quick to judge, right? Like just do the right thing. Don't do a wrong thing. Um, But what we found is that people judge themselves heavily for their decisions in these situations. And so having compassion for ourselves and how difficult these situations can be can be incredibly important. And of course, compassion for others, not knowing all the details or context behind decisions they may be making. And then also things like honesty and accountability, right? And what I mean there is honesty with ourselves around the motivation behind why we're doing something. And we can't really be authentic. We can't make decisions well or even know if it falls in line with our values unless we're also being honest with ourselves. And then accountable for our behavior also. I don't think that we can actually be ethical without being accountable. And accountability gets a pretty negative rap sometimes, right? Like if you can imagine how you feel if somebody says, I'm going to hold you accountable for that. I think all of us have a little bit of a a stress reaction, but I'm talking about it in a slightly different way here that I think being accountable is about being responsible and reliable. And it's something that we can actually even build into decisions as we're making them. Oh, this decision feels like it could be a bit of a slippery slope for me. I know how I might end up handling this down the road. So if I talk to some people, about it in the beginning around what's at stake and how I'm hoping to handle it, then they can help hold me accountable by being accountability partners. And I think that that can be a very ethical way to navigate some of these really difficult choices. Are the choices different? Are the dilemmas different when it's economic, when when just money is involved? I feel like A lot of us associate the idea of selling out with decisions that are economic. And in fact, a lot of the decisions that came up did have to do with economic security. But I think that there's a really important spectrum even there. And what I mean by that is that there's a difference between, again, I'm already comfortable, I'm already you know, able to support my family and so on. I just want to have more. And so I'm going to sacrifice some things that are important to me otherwise in order to just do whatever it takes to become more and more wealthy or have more and more goods. And and that's a never ending quest versus um, I'm needing to make a compromise because I need to support my family or my heat's not working and I need to be able to, you know, survive. And also between doing this as a long-term strategy, you know, I'm just going to find any opportunity to increase economic wealth wherever I can versus one of our stories where we saw a person who made those compromises earlier so that he could really live a more values-driven life later, right? He got to do the job that he truly loved down the road. Um, I think very few of us are able to do that kind of switch once we see all the shiny goodies that we can get from a really high paying position. Um, But I feel like that was a very strategic choice to um, create the security and then let that go. And in order to really um, pursue passion. And so I think that within that realm of selling out decisions related to money or material wealth, there can be like a pretty interesting spectrum and a pretty significant raise between more ethical and what I think of as less, less ethical decisions. Do you find differences in, in your research on this, differences among generations in terms of how they approach these issues? I think one thing that's interesting right now is thinking about our younger generations and some things that we're seeing that I would say are, feel unique to them. So I'm part of Gen X, so I have that particular perspective. And my co-author is part of, um, she's millennial. And so we already were coming from different places in terms of how we understood these decisions and priorities. But I think one of the things that we're seeing as millennials and even Gen Z enter the workforce, there's there's 
maybe an, even more than in the past, a desire for work that's meaningful and can make a difference in the world. And I think in some past generations, it could felt it felt a little bit more like find a job that's stable and practical and that you can just have for your life rather than some of these, this desire um I think increasing or maybe an expectation even that work will provide these things um, at the same time as having, you know, huge financial anxiety. And I think we've heard that a lot from younger generations, you know, increase in student loan debt, economic future uncertainty and so on. And so one of the things that I think would be important for us to think about with career conversations with these generations is to be thinking about the strain that's caused by those two pulls and, ways that we can creatively resolve those types of conflicts. I think that um, those polls are true with any generation, but the ways that they play out and, what, and the expectations of ourselves have shifted somewhat that in some of the younger generations, a person will actually feel like they're a bad person or guilty or so on if they're not able to actually meet both needs. And so I think that anxiety is a really interesting and, and difficult thing to navigate. Is this a more, finally, is this a more contemporary problem? Is this a problem that, that has grown more significant over the past 10, 15 years? I feel like this problem is something that has been true across time and space, really. I think that every generation has struggled with it. I think every time period there's been a struggle around it, but Currently, when we're, what we're looking at with both what I was describing around younger generations and some of the ways that they're holding this uniquely, and then also our overall climate and how divided it is and the pressures that each of us feel as a result of that, um, I think we're getting away from the ability to see the gray between the black and white thinking, we're losing some nuance. And so it's not that this is a new phenomenon, it's that it has new urgency. Um, and I feel like this is a particularly important time to be having this conversation. Inga Hansen, the book is The Ethical Sellout, Maintaining Your Integrity in the Age of Compromise. Inga, I thank you so much for spending time with us. Thank you. It's been my pleasure. Thank you.